Welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk after RNG's incredibly dominant victory over the Wildcats. That was definitely the most impressive win of the day in my eyes. When we take a look at the post-game breakdown stats and graphics and you just see this gold lead running away with it, I just want to echo what Dracos and Venice were saying in the cast. RNG showed not only uh, an appreciation and respect for what the Wildcats can do, targeting a Holy Phoenix, putting on something with lower impact, but then they absolutely ran away with the game. That's the thing, and you know, that started from draft phase as well with the bands that just were against them. It just felt like they didn't recognize Wildcats as an entire team. They recognized it as Holy Phoenix. Put him on a Jin who's a facilitator, and all of a sudden they're playing a different playstyle. But even in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it really mattered. Like, RNG in every role specifically were outperforming the members of Wildcats. They are the defending MSI champions. Oh, does that mean something? It, you, you'd think, <laughs> you actually, it, it is hard to repeat as MSI champions only because to qualify, you actually have to win uh, the LPL in RNG's case. But there there have been MSIs where the LPL team has came in maybe a little bit lazy or started a little bit slow. This was not that team. They, they came out firing and they completely overmatched the Wildcats. And I also just feel like, you know, in conjunction with the players we're seeing here, we actually see some of them still step up. I think Finn, if you watched LPL, you know his regular season was a big question mark. If you only watched the finals, you probably thought the guy was a god. But the thing <laughs> is, he actually had a really inconsistent performance. This time around, though, on the Gwen, you know, he's still keeping that momentum going. And arguably, players on Wildcats aren't as good as the competition would be in LPL, but that's not to really take it away from the fact that RNG, they're still looking really crisp. They really are. One thing I'm going to ask about this is now, that was the result that we were expecting. Yep. The manner in which RNG won, in my mind, was a even stronger domination or a stronger statement in terms of the win. I want to take a look at the group standings very quickly and start to draw a little bit of conclusions from the day before we move into our last pre-match because the expected results have come through. I think the, the way in which those games have played out has been a little surprising. Average game time so far, 26 minutes, 34 seconds. That is wow. very one-sided opening set of five games. What are some of the key takeaways you've got so far? Before? Honestly, I actually feel like every game so far has come down to exactly what I expected. And I actually think, even stylistically, it came to that point as well. The games we were talking about with what we set up in pregame pretty much is what happened during that game as well. I think my biggest surprise probably was how close the first game of the day really became with VCS. But outside of that, I think every other game has been played down to a tee from the teams that were winning. Yeah, I think the teams have also done their homework. We haven't seen a uh, a top region come up against a lower tier region and disrespect their picks, right? Like uh, Order had Evelyn banned against them, right? Yeah. Like even RNG, like Bin's Camille's first Camille band is, as well. is yeah. Camille banned. So all of these teams, or, or Impact had Orn banned in 4-5 against him by G2. So teams are actually very well prepared for this first stage, even when you're in a group like uh, the NAEU order group, where they're going to be playing eight times. There's tons of repetition. But as we said, it's actually the favorite has won every game convincingly. So that means to me, the underdogs are the ones we're looking to adapt, to develop, to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to see who's going to be able to do that because it is another five days of games. We still have another matchup to come. But final thoughts before we move on to our pre-match. Well, I just feel like, once again, like it, it's a fight for the second seed for a lot of these groups. That's just what it comes down to in the end. I don't think, I'm not expecting T1 and RNG to be threatened in terms of that number one seed. That is a fantastic segue because in the fight for second and our last game of the day, Red Canids are taking on PSG Talent. Now, the PCS champions made semi-finals lost MSI. But this PSG talent is a very different lineup taking to the stage this time around. They are also, while still the champions from their region, not as dominant. I'm trying to remember what Jat said in Countdown, that Dignitas have an influence on the international yeah. stage. No right? one expected that, but <laughs> they took River away from PSG. Uh, and so this is the 2021 lineup that had a lot of success, actually, at MSI. They pushed, uh, they, they moved all the way into the semifinals. Yeah. So... It's, that's, that's always the battle, actually, if we're looking forward towards the Rumble stage, as NAEU and PCS are fighting for those final two spots. But now they've swapped out jungle mid, and I think for this team, even though Hanabi, Unified, and Kai Wing are a very good trio, the link between them and their Korean mid jungle has been 
poor in a lot of times. So they, they play well through Unified, but they just don't really feel like they're clicking on all cylinders like last year's PSG. No, it is also a team that's been forced to change their style. Like Hanabi were quite often on a carry as well, and they're playing through River as well, through lane priorities, get River ahead when the game mm -hmm. moves Kyring around the map. This time around, Hanabi has been more on the tanks instead. He's been a facilitator. We see the team fight composition comes through. It's a slower paced game as well. It's more about facilitating the lanes, and Unified has to step up immensely. He's the highest damage share on the team as well, and he's usually the guy that will be the carry for this team. And it's, it's a weird statement, but they actually slumped in playoffs. Yeah, it's true. So they went 16 and 2 in the regular season, and then their combined win loss in playoffs was 10 and 7. So they, they did win, so maybe there was a big learning experience there, but it's important to note that they didn't steamroll the whole What year. I love about that is almost every other team that we talk about, the playoff run, the lower bracket run, which is something Pierce Chitham also did, which is something Red Canis yeah. also did. The storyline for almost every other team is that they got better when they hit the lower bracket. They got development when they hit the playoffs. I mean, for our entire Group C, NA, EU, and LCO, that is the story for all three teams, right? But for PSG Talent, now, despite the fact that they are still anticipated to be the second seed, despite the fact they're still anticipated to be better than Brazil and Turkey, the chips are stacked against them somewhat, Goldberg. Yeah, I mean, it's once again, like, it, it's a slower play style coming through. And I feel like when you match top up against Red Canits now instead, who's also got a slow play style, which will kind of just be the same stylistic of both these teams, it's going to be very interesting because this will be a fight where it kind of comes down to later team fights instead, where we don't see all this early pro activity that we've seen earlier, at least not according to what data we have from seeing this team in their own region. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask stats live. I should have prepped this, but do we have any games go past 30 minutes? Can you give me an update in my ear? And maybe this will be the first. Today, that's right. Thank you very much, Marcus, in the stats seat. <laughs> what I will say is that let's talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the Red Canons, of course, because they are looking to turn the tides for CBLOL. I think CBLOL, mm -hmm. once upon a time, many, many years ago, was one of these up-and-coming regions that was looking to take games and challenge the top of the table. Now, Turkey's somewhat overtaken. The PCS is overtaken. The VCS has overshadowed all of them, right? And for the Red Canids, this is a roster that has been together for a while. Uh, you know, they, have, they do have a lot of experience, but it is a region that has not been able to replicate the success of years gone by. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's also a region where, once again, it, it's a way slower style than all the other regions. These guys have played together for a while. I've, we even saw them at the mm. World's Play-Ins as well. They fell out in the knockout stage of play-ins uh, against, uh, against the uh, OCC back then as well. Um, this is a team of, team of scored that have developed synergy, that still have the same kind of reminiscence of the play style. They slowed a little bit down on top side instead, actually, and put more resources in towards the bottom side of the map where you have a star player in your AD carry, Titan, instead, who's also won multiple titles for uh, CB LOL, of course. Expand a little bit on some of those early game stats for me because we're anticipating another slower game. I have got confirmation from our stats team. The only game that went above 30 minutes was G2 versus EG at 31 and a half minutes. Wow. I think it might be a safe bet to say this could be the second one. Help fast. Good book, yeah. what do you make of these? Yeah, so I mean, First off, take a look at Red Cannons here, okay? This is a team that won their league, okay? And I want you to look at the gold difference at 14. Their average, it's in the Negative. minors yeah. from a team that won their region. This team is the definition of, you know, falling behind and always have the to come go back. Kids. Exactly, they, they, they literally want to make themselves look better. It's like, well, we always come back in comebacks. The thing is, they have a play style that's very much about taking towers in a slow modical style. They'll fall behind in laning phase, then they come back in the mid game with clever rotations, finally finding their uh, level of play with their hands in team fights <laughs> instead. Uh, well, it's a hand stiff sometimes for these region, and these players are yeah. reminiscent of showing that as well. Yeah, I, I want to actually shout out Kelsey Moser for this point, but a lot of teams in the CB LOL still try and play on three lanes, but most of like the big teams now play on two, two lanes, lanes, and Red Cannons is one of those teams. So I, I can actually see how they're losing early games. Other teams are trying to maximize goals, but playing like way too risky, so they're able to group and win team fights and, and kind of take over the game that way. That is how they struggled their way through the region to make it here. Out of interest, Cobalt, just very quickly, do you think it's fair to draw a comparison to the Mad Lions of last year that would fall behind and then come back through big team fights, or is that too too strong of a comparison to make for our viewers? On the, like, when you look at it on the paper, yes, immediately, but outside of that, no, they do it in different points. Different like, it's ways. a complete different rotations coming through. Okay, well, now it is time for our mascot fan predictions. I want to see what you have all voted for at home, and then I'll ask my analysts to make a prediction as well. You can make sure to let us know every single day who you think will win by heading to at MasterCard Nexus on Twitter. And for today's fan poll, we're taking a look at PSG Talent with 77.8% of the vote. That was my anticipation as well. Really? I think I was expecting them to be fan favorites. I'm expecting a lot of our viewers not to be necessarily as in tune with some of the differences. Why are you so shocked, Jets? I just expected the CB Law fans to be more passionate.
That's that's what I wow. remember. Cold out. There like, we go. Brazil. Vamos. They Come lost on. the faith. It's <laughs> unfortunate. Well, that's a tough one. Goldborg, what do you make of the vote? And also, who will win this game? Yeah, I mean, the vote is very surprising. Uh, I could be trying to get more Brazilian fans to me. I don't think that's the way to do it. I will still say that I think PSG talent uh, will be able to come out ahead. They have the individuals. And if they're just allowed to have a slow um, early game and just get to the mid to late game where they have their strength, I think they'll just roll the game. PSG made semifinals last year. It's not the same team. That's simple. That's a PSG made semifinals. Not the same team, but the same expectations. The fans have spoken. Let's see what happens on the rift as we close out the day with the Ray Cannons versus PSG talent. The fan. Thank you very much, guys. Of course, welcome to the desk. Now, they're setting a lot of expectations about the game and about the group, but we're going to take a quick second to set one on pronunciation yes. because we've learned from years of butchering CB Law players' names that uh, one, we'd probably never be very good at speaking Portuguese, and two, right. we will be roasted no matter what we say. So the way we pronounce names is the way that the players have told us to pronounce their names. Yeah, from and the players. From the players. And look, I'm not going to say I'm going to nail the pronunciation. It might sound terrible to you, whether you speak Portuguese or any other You're language. You're going to be offended. You're going to be. And we're gonna I just want to apologize, but we're going to try our best. Because if a player says to me, if Faker says my name is now Fa... Well, I can't say that <laughs> word. If that's how he says <laughs> I'm supposed to pronounce it, that's how I'm pronouncing it. He's the GOAT, and I'm going to give the CB Law players the same respect, okay? So let's just, we're going to move on now, because I kind of messed that one up even more than I normally would. So, uh, oh, yeah. a delay. That's good. It's going to stay on us for a little while. So it's not Titan, it's Cheetan. It's not uh, Gigu, or, or yeah, it's Gigu. It's not Gigu. Guigo. Yeah. It's Gigu. It's Gigu. Iagus. Aegis. 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 Yes. It's the yeah, Jojo. It's like, it's like Aegis, but it's Grevthar, like, that one's kind of like Grevthar that's kinda and Chitan and speaker. then Jojo. Yeah. yeah. So and so, we're gonna still make mistakes there, but like bear with us. <laughs> we're gonna try. We're yes. gonna try our best. And uh hopefully people enjoy that. It's um yeah, so expectations are I mean the analyst desk already set the expectations pretty clearly. Mm. Even with the roster changes that PSG did make, uh a lot of the I mean, I was going to say core of the roster, but often when you think of like a player like Maple, you think of him as kind of the core of the roster, right? Yeah. Uh, but when I do think of like Unified and Kaiwing in particular, how that bot lane and how they have fed internationally in the past, uh, it's a bot lane that you do have to respect. Uh, yeah. And I think that when we look at how they have found a lot of success by playing through this bot lane, mm -hmm. it's... Hard to imagine that they're not going to be the favorites, especially when we have seen a few of these players internationally in the past. Chitan, when he made his debut, a lot of hype was actually coming in from behind him, and he wasn't quite able to deliver on the expectations that were kind of put on his shoulders. And of course, as a young player, you could argue that was a little unfair, but yeah, Brazilian sure. fans are often very passionate about their teams, and they have these high expectations. They want to see them do well, and you kind of look at the past where with teams like Pain Gaming and BRTT in particular, like uh, really and, standing out yeah. on the international stage. And that's, that's the Brazilians name. want that again. Exactly, know? and I think that that's kind of the legacy that Chitan is expected to live up to, and that is that is a lot of pressure. And while CB Law hasn't always had, uh, you know, the best international results. I think you still want to see that good showing. You still want to see that good performance. You want to know that your team came out here and and actually showed up. And I think For that sure. now they're much better set up to do so. They've had more experience under their belt. And to be honest, they played a, a clean style that we saw and a lot of reflected in a lot of other parts of the world where it was funneling plays in your AD carry, getting a lot of early items into it, into champions like Jinx, Fortune, John, playing these very supportive, or rather not supportive, but tanky picks, strong frontliners to make sure that he can execute and the team can execute well in team fights. And while we've seen some teams veer away from that today in the new meta, you have to feel like that's always going to be a safe fallback for this team to go towards. And what we can say based on the games today Bot lane is the place for violence and variability, right? We've been yeah, seeing absolutely. Samira's, Lucian's, uh, Tristana's. Like, I think our most passive game was what the G2 EG bot lane, where typically when you think of those styles as well in the early laning phase, they're not super bot centric. But when we bring it back to these teams, you expect both these teams to be playing towards the bot side of the map. While they're not the most aggressive early game teams, especially in like recent performances, um, these are these are the lanes that you expect to play around, and I'm curious as to what their priorities will be. Will we actually see a much more aggressive Cheetan, perhaps? Will we see him being given the Lucian to try and dominate the yeah. two versus two? How will Unified look to approach this lane matchup? Like the champions that these two actually have, like the most played, as, well, most AD carries have most That's played. That's the problem, just right? Been nerfed, right? So yeah. it's difficult to predict exactly what these. Uh, players will bring out, and then how will the rest of the map get involved? I expect top lane to be a bit of an island, like Orn, Nah, Gragas, yeah. you know, just the isolated top lane matchup and a lot more about fighting in the bot side of the map and hopefully some banger team fights. 
And I'm certainly hoping for some interesting picks, because as you highlighted, Jinx of Felios, those are everybody's most played. Nobody plays much else past that. Maybe you get the occasional Zaya. In the case of Teton, he's got a couple games on Ezreal. And obviously, people have deeper champion pools. Those were just the two best champions for so incredibly long that we're going to have to remind ourselves of what some of these champion pools look like when those champions are taken off the board or nerfed down, as is in the case on these patches. For now, though, Graves, GP taken off the board. to be, of course, a stellar gangplank player, so not giving the opportunity to blind pick that whatsoever. Ever. Lucian also being taken off the board alongside Renata. You know, thinking more about this Lucian priority as well, throughout the day, he's obviously been picked or banned, right? But he's very flexible as well, right? The fact that, I mean, in Europe, we saw him play mid, we've seen him play top internationally. We know that he can obviously be played in AD carry. That simple fact alone, I think, is a large part of why we're seeing so many bans as well, because the fact that you can draft yourself either a strong 2v2 or flex it into a different role makes that champion very scary in the meta right now. But we talked about bot lane. PSG are going to show respect towards the bot lane by banning away a lot of supports and the Lucian as well. Now we're going to see the Wukong first pick immediately locked in. Of course, again, 12-7, the change where he could leap over walls to get some buffs to his Q cooldown, as well as the damage to monsters. But in general, really enabling him to play uh, much stronger in the jungle and take away some of those early laning phases weaknesses that he had struggled with in the past, outside of, of course, against very heavy AD composition. So see where it goes. Expecting it to go into the jungle walls. On the opposite side, look, if it ain't broke, don't <laughs> fix it. And Aphelios, well, he, he might nerfed. be, yeah, he might be a... Uh, broken, but he's not broke. He didn't get nerfed, so use him. He's strong, offers an engage option, offers a strong laning phase, overall very powerful champion. And curious to see now how Red are going to respond. AP jungle and the hover is what I'm thinking for yeah. Chitan. Uh, they might not pick it now. They may want to just grab themselves an early support. Things like Norlus have been very prevalent. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that one. We've been seeing a lot of this Gwen Wukong combo. Obviously, we talked about how the the buffs to Gwen. Oh. Okay, shit. so I'll finish my point okay. and then come okay. back to that. But uh, we, the buffs to Gwen obviously made her that much more viable again in pro. I'm surprised as to how viable she has suddenly become. The fact that teams are saying, well, you know what? Now that she's back on the playing field, there are very few answers that teams have for her. I always like to think of champions like Trindamir that yeah. can be used as a means to try and shut her down. But PSG right now are saying, we're going for the safe scaling approach. By going for the Nar, they will have a little bit more frontline, a little bit of safety, and overall, a very solid foundation for a good teamfight comp later on into the game. But that Jin, second time we've seen it now. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm not a massive fan. Nope. Maybe this Umbral Glaive tech will be continued, and it's something that we're just not familiar with yet. Yes. Uh, but while Jin can be a very powerful laner, uh, I'm a little surprised because Chitan has played MF this split, and MF, I think, has actually been shown to be a really good answer into things like Aphelios as well. Gives you a lot of team fight power, and I think it would have synergized very well with the Wukong they drafted for themselves. So I'm a little surprised that they chose to go for a different direction, but this also, to me, suggests that they're looking for a Nautilus support. So let's see if PSG look to remove that from the pool. For now, it is LeBlanc, but I think one thing that is different from our previous game is that while LeBlanc and Jin were really the sole sources of reliable damage on their team, the composition so far for Red Cannons does have a Wukong, does have a Gwen. So Jin can play a utility role more comfortably, has champions that that setup can be used for, has a lot of upfront damage from those champions that he can look to finish off with his ultimate. So it does feel a little bit stronger for Jin as a champion, but we'll see what it looks like once we have the supports locked in as well. For now, Yumi, a lot of the range supports being taken away. Feels like PSG want a fist fight in the bot lane, I'm not going to lie limiting all of these safe kind of stand back supports for these champions that can get lane control early on. Might just see engage versus engage as the Bex and LeBlanc both taken off the board. Well, the analyst has highlighted it, right? Red typically play from behind, you know? And by eliminating a lot of these scaling supports, they're preventing this late game team fight damage threat sure. that Red typically like to play towards. Now, I did want to note with the Vex ban coming through from PSG, heavily indicated to me that an Ari was going to come through for PSG in mid. That ban in response is great for Red, but now they can look for something like a Rise. Uh, instead, they're going to choose to lock in the Nautilus themselves, deny that as an option. Of course, Aphelios Nautilus, 
very tried and true, very staple, very stock standard bot lane. I would have thought that they would consider a Thresh, but still a very viable option here for them. And now they have what is a very traditional front to back team fight comp, right? With the absolutely uh, with the Aphelios acting as your primary damage. You have frontline in the form of Nar and Nautilus. You have pretty solid engage. You just need to round things out with typically a control mage mid. But let's see what they choose to go for. And I think the thing here is that if the Zoe does get locked in, we have excellent, excellent poke champions with the Jin and the Zoe paired as a combo. You have great engage with Gwen and Wukong potentially going in together. I'm concerned for Unified because a lot of the times in the past you would see the Thresh pairing and that would give Aphelios so much safety. See something like a Braum mitigate a lot of this long range poke damage. Nautilus, yes, he goes in very well, does not peel nearly as well. So Unified definitely going to need to play this one cleanly, but again, Expected to pull ahead in the early game, PSG, as Red are often the team falling behind, and Red often falling behind, but snowballing their AD carry. They're going to have to show us something different than they did in a lot of those games in the finals. It's not just about running Jinx around the map and grabbing plates anymore. You're going to need to distribute that gold a little bit differently with a champion like Jin on your team, as Leona's going to be locked in. No surprises there. Zoe, and now the final pick for PSG to see what they're going to put into the mid lane. Ariana is my prediction. I think it's good. It's good protection. It's good zone control. Stops your Aphelios from getting one shot a lot of the time. Come on, give me one. Give me one. And that's going to be locked in, right? Boom. Ooh, Betty, genius. <laughs> World-class analyst. Pop, pop, pop. <laughs> Got him. I mean, it's also just, I think it makes the most sense in the context of what they drafted, right? Yep. We already talked about a very traditional st stock standard front to back, good scaling. The best thing to complement something like this is a control mage that offers utility. Their only other option would have been Victor, uh, but I think that in this matchup in particular, Oriana just fares better into the Zoe than the Victor does. Um, so not really a surprise. PSG got a lot of their comfort picks. When you look across the board, these are champions that they've played a lot throughout the split. Uh, and they're pretty happy. They're looking for the scaling front-to-back team fight. Red, they have a few more options, mm -hmm. but their their comp is a little more disjointed, right? They have relatively good siege in the form of Zoe and Jin acting as a powerful poke. But then you've also got this Gwen, who's like a pretty good team fighter, but also pretty good at split pushing. You then have this Wukong engage, followed up by a Leona and a Jin and a Zoe that are like fine in team fights, but they're kind of better at poking. So. Like, sure, they have some win conditions, they have some options available to them, but a lot of their champions kind of want to do slightly different things, and they don't all work towards the same goal that PSG's well-rounded comp does. And I think it's interesting because it's a huge opportunity for Red Cannons to show us more, because again, you heard it from the desk, they fall behind early, they come back playing on two lanes, playing for team fights. This time, they have a composition where if they get ahead in the early game with a Zoe, with a Jin, if they break that mid lane tier one tower early, they can take over the game completely. But it will not be with full on 5v5 team fights. It will not be falling back to a scaling Jinx with an Orn or a Gragas or some defensive pick like that. This is a very, very different look for the Cannons. They're going to need to show us another side of themselves, a side we did not really see in their finals. They want to come ahead here against PSG. And I want to remind people a couple of the stakes as well, Welcome simply because. As the analyst desk was talking about, this PSG is not the same PSG from last year's MSI. Yeah, absolutely. But PSG did make it to the semifinals. Um, they they went they lost 3-1 to RNG in those semis. And I think that with the changes to their mid-jungle, the expectations are that while they should still be good, they're gonna be weaker than what they were. And I think this is a big proving opportunity for them, right? To showcase that they are still an international contender, they can still make it out of this group, and I think they want to showcase a dominant performance here to cement themselves as a solid contender in this group. Whereas Red, they want to create that upset, Minions because based on RNG's won. game one, they're very clearly favorites in this group. Absolutely. And it is the PSG spots that you're looking to contest and you're trying to take away from them. Absolutely. And I think the important thing to remember here for the side of PSG is that PSG are no strangers to changes or being underestimated. True. How many times did they not get to field their starting five? How many times did Doggo come in and substitute? How many times did something mess up their otherwise well-laid plans and domestic success? So if any team can adapt, have to give PSG that credit. That said, Maple River, very strong addition to the team. Bay, Juhan, definitely need a little bit more time, it feels like, to be able to work together. Some language barriers, some inconsistencies. That said, unified Kai Wing Hanabi, strong three-man core, if I have ever seen one. Maybe they can get something done. Good hook to interrupt the engage there. Chichan fishing for the fourth shot, but will not find it. However, lane control, very much in the favor of Red for now. Okay, Kai Wing, I see you. That was that was very well played. Interrupting the Zenith there. Chitan and Jojo looking to get a little bit of control in the early 2v2. 
and it's immediately interrupted. So PSG already taking that slightly safer, more reserved approach. Just looking to farm for the time being. Level two is coming at the same time on the top side. Difficult, difficult. Hanabi obviously wanting to keep Gwen at an arm's length. Oversteps one time, she leaps on top of you. She gets a good trade. Good news is she doesn't have any CC, so yeah, you can just do that. You're not too punished if you overstep one time, but once Gwen starts to win a lane, she usually continues to win it. We'll see what happens once there are a few more items under the belt. And of course, important to note the discrepancy in summoners. Ghost versus the Flash here. It can be difficult if the Gwen finds any kind of advantage whatsoever. But across the map, pretty quiet early game, all things considered. Fighting for pressure sort of as expected. And instead, now turning our eyes towards the jungler, seeing where the Viego goes early, seeing if Aegis wants to go for maybe some early ganks with Wukong or just farm up to the level six. Keep my eyes on the jungler as you highlighted. Juhan starting up towards the top side of the map, path back towards bot, hovering around that side of the map right now. Both junglers should meet. The important thing to note is that Juhan does not have priority in the bot lane two versus two, which means that Chitan and Jojo can collapse first. The junglers will spot each other out. Here we go. Aegis stepping in, going for a little bit of these early trades. Remember, Wukong gets a lot of armor from his passive. The smite's well going to heal a lot. Regen. Looks like he has just taken control over the crowd. Okay. Juhan playing to the bottom side when he did not have Cryo there. Of course, Grepthar does give up a bit of lane pressure. He is going to take a bit of a bad trade here just so he can move down and support his bay. Trying to clear what he can. Ooh, good sidestep there. Necessary. As I just was making his way towards the mid lane wave. Grefthal though, falling short in these trades. And this comes back to what I was talking about in draft. The isolated 1v1 Orianna can be such an oppressive bully, even at early levels. And uh, Zoe, with her relatively long cooldown to early levels, just kind of gets poked out. So, matchup going very well for Bay so far. Farm pretty even across the board. Slight deficit up towards the top side of the map, kind of as we expect. Gwen. Just doing Gwen things, really. Important to note that that bot wave should be slow pushing in favor of Unified and Kai Wing, so they can back to base, pick up some long swords, and uh, actually catch this next wave. So overall, a slow laning phase. It's somewhat what I expected, Dracos, mm -hmm. like when we looked at the drafts. Uh, but as a result of this, I am a little concerned as we get later on into the game with this composition from Red Cannons. We already talked a lot about how the composition kind of wants to do different things. Yeah. Chitan and Grevthar, really good at finding picks, really good at poke, uh, really good at sieging towers in particular, whereas the Wukong and the Gwen, really good at skirmishing, really valuable in team fights, does very well in a side lane. Um, and it's kind of like that duo and then the mid AD carry duo that have like slightly different goals in mind. Yeah. So how they navigate around those team fights is going to be interesting to watch. Absolutely is. Hanabi. Playing oh, this wave here. sucks. <laughs> this is, yeah. This is misery territory, observers. He knows, he knows. Giving us the horror movie vision highlight. Ooh, the bounce over the head. I respect it. Looking for the third auto for an extra bit of movement speed, but it's just not going to be enough. Red Cannons find it first blood. Nice, really nice play overall. They set up the wave perfectly. The ghost is used by Guigo, but it doesn't matter. Uh, they end up getting the kill. They find themselves in early leads. And while this will give PSG control, over the bot side of the map. Um, getting Grigo into a position where he can kind of win that isolated 1v1 really sets him up for success, and it's kind of what you want to do when you have a Gwen as well. Certainly. Leona getting the kill, obviously not super ideal, but Wukong getting True. an assist, not too bad overall. So Grigo continues to do on the top side as Wukong builds closer and closer to what we assume will be the Divine Sunder, probably for both junglers at this stage. And so far, very quiet. Very often when you look at historical success before coming into a game like this, you see this the success that the PCS and specifically PSG has had. It usually means early game disaster, absolute dominance from one side, one side of matchup. But Red Cannon is doing very well to hold their own, really leveraging a lot of strength to their individual champions here in the early game. And again, credits to Jojo for that roam. Knows his gen can just sit in bot lane and be fine, moves up to the top side. Hanabi, he's not going to be too phased by this though. He's a veteran. That's been playing for a very long time now. Those that have followed the international scene should be very familiar with his name. Yeah, okay, he's fallen a little bit behind early, but it's not the end of the world. He's just going to continue to farm up. He knows he acts as that front line. Are you just securing another crab? The frustration ping comes down from Juhan, where he's like, I hate Guys, losing crabs. I would, I would really like to get crabs. We could just make sure that that happens. That'd be fantastic. Big seafood fan. Big seafood fan. Loves it. Dungeness. King, 
other types of crab. I only know two. I was going to say, what are you listing right now? Because my knowledge of crabs is very limited. I know that they are expensive. And that's about all I know. You can make them to cakes. That's, a, that's, that's where my knowledge extends. They're worth a lot of gold and they give you vision. That's about it. That's I didn't it. know about the crabs that kill me in Elden Ring. That's true. Better than the lobsters, though. We can say that for certain. <laughs> Those sniper lobsters. Very terrifying. Sniper lobsters. Speaking of terrifying, uh, Sniper Zoe from downtown. Obviously, if PSG do fall behind, we talked about how while the uh, way that Ness Red maybe want to play these fights isn't perfectly synced, if Zoe gets ahead, Unified's life is going to be a nightmare. Juhan's life is going to be a nightmare. Hanabi's life is going to be a nightmare because, yes, Meganar, big, tanky, beefy, frontliner. Uh, Minar, more describing tiny, words. <laughs> more describing adjectives. Tiny, little, baby, yordle. That's, you know, so it's, uh, could be hard. And an even game, I'm, a, I'm with you that I think it still favors PSG as we get later and later into the game, but Red, their life gets so easy if they can just break open mid, and the first step to making that happen is getting this Herald. Here we go, look at the rotation from Bot, Chitan, and Jojo on their way. Ooh, big Ooh, damage big, big, onto big, big, big. Force Flash! Oh! oh! Chitan! Beautiful pick comes in from the river. Bay was not expecting it, even burnt the flash, but still loses his life. Red Canids find themselves with two kills, and they're continuing to amass this gold lead. This will secure themselves the Herald, and they can gain even more control over the early game. If they also break down mid in the near future, Zoe's life becomes so fantastic. So utterly easy, you're, you're walking through fog of war, you're throwing out bubbles, nobody can sit safely in their lane. It would be massive for Red if they continue to push this advantage forward. Right now, just that wave in mid, doesn't look like they have enough pressure, but that is always the thing I keep my eye on anytime we see a Zoe in pro play. Now, I'm gonna say this again, because this is the second time we've seen the Emerald Glaive Jin, and you know, we're not familiar with it. We're gonna do more research, especially I'm, after I, today's I'll games. Say I'm skeptical, I am absolutely willing to be wrong. I remain skeptical. Let's have a look at this play once Ooh. again. The root into the ult, flashes away. Ooh, Ooh. good damage. And a good Ooh. pick overall. Very well played. But yeah, it's now that we've seen it twice, it makes you think, okay, there's probably something we don't know. Yeah. So uh, I probably. mean, it's a cost-effective item. Oh, it clears sure. vision very quickly. Very powerful. Uh, in general, it's just very strong. It when it's just good, be, it's very good. It's one of those things where, like, as a first item, like for the value that it gives, sure. It's just a, a very. It probably just gives you a very strong spike. I mean, like. One tick of his ultimate helped him secure that kill, right? Yeah. So, like, the damage is definitely nothing to scoff at. And uh, it's definitely going more favorable than what we saw last game, that's for sure. Certainly. They are setting up a wave right now. Looks like they're not going to risk any dive. Can look to back to base. Maybe spend some of that gold that they're sitting on. Yeah, and I will say, like, thinking more about it, because of the cost reduction, you do get that completed item before your opposition if the lane is even, right? Well, which means that you then set yourself up for a potential fight or or play that bit earlier. Let's also remember, as with most of the items, hold that thought. Gigu going forward there. Uh, it's very cheap. The build path is very easy. Yeah, There's exactly. a ton of long swords. Your backs are easy. Last time, Varus was super popular as a lethality yes. AD carry. This point. item was very strong on him. That's he true. would buy it, mostly because it's, you know, it's 200, 300 gold cheaper, and uh, it's just easy. Every time you back, you can buy something. There are no bad backs when you're building lethality generally, and that's, that's true. Certainly the case when you're building something like a Okay, yeah, I, I see a little bit more. Perhaps we were just skewed in last game because, I mean, they were losing. I, I, I'm so. going to be wrong. I just like, you know, maybe I'm a, a bad gin player. I'm definitely a bad gin player. <laughs> I just like, I like my mythics. I like my Yomus. I like to go fast. You know, playing for the team, respectable. Is it questionable? I don't know. Someone send us the map. Happy to be wrong. Cheetan. is caught out here. Ignite already ticking oh, down. He's running for the hills. Unified a mile away, however. Dolus so, just casually solo killing Chitan there, not a problem. Did burn the ignite, will force Chitan low, lost the heal as well. Big thing here though for the Jin is that he can still just ult in this fight and give you plenty. Objective getting lower, we're going for the full on 50 50. That's going to be the two man with the lead board from Wukong is big. It stops Unified from hitting the multi man ult. They're just going immediately to the back line now. Jojo looking to follow up. Here comes the curtain call. Unified needs to make his way out base, stepping forward to body block. He's going to save his AD carry, but again, Red taking advantage in the exchange. Yes, PSG get the dragon, but Grimthar hungry for a little bit more. That's one sleepy Orianna. She will not get taken out. Damn, Red Canids, they're just making all the right decisions in this early game. They haven't ballooned this gold lead, but 2k, 11 and a half minutes. Expectations be damned, right? Of course, PSG, they have taken a very passive approach in this early game. We haven't really seen them force any plays. They did just secure that Drake, but I love the aggression that we are seeing from Red Cannons. They recognize that they need to be making stuff happen on the map. 
and they're making it work. Aegis now 2-0 on one on the Wukong. And let's have a look back at this fight. So the Shockwave comes down to do this early on. Doesn't really do that much damage. Aegis not quite able to land the smite, but notice he's gonna flash commit here and create so much damage and disruption on the back line. This means that then the follow-up damage from Grenthar and Cheetan is just destructive. It forces PSG to split up and they're able to find these isolated picks and Red end up coming out on top. And the thing about picks like Jin and Zoe is if you start winning a fight, you usually keep winning the fight because Jin has so much execute damage, Zoe gets to reset with all these summoner spells. It's so easy to keep a fight going once you have any kind of advantage. Harold though, dropped on the top side, looking like they're putting this gold into both the back pockets of Aegis and uh, Kiku as well. So funneling this Wukong, 2-0-1 already the scoreline. Yes, he's a bit behind in jungle CS, but 4.6k, nothing to scoff at, and a 2 out of Wukong ahead of the clock is going to be a very terrifying thing for PSG to deal with. Oh, for sure. You haven't seen that many successful Wukong games of the day so far, but this could very well be the best early game Wukong we've seen of the day. Divine Sunderer. Ooh, what? 57. Very good. What I will say is that, uh, again, big shout out to. Oh, hang on. Jojo. Fishing. Gonna get the flash for free from Bay. Really? That means that. Yeah. Just, just respect to the setup here from Red because often one of the big criticisms that you'll have from teams that aren't outside of the major regions are uh, their setup. But they had the top wave pushed in, which I can't really highlight here, but they, they had the top wave pushed in. <laughs> they sacked the bot in order to bring their bot lane up and then set up a potential dive on mid. And then by forcing them back, not only will they cross map and trade for the top tier one, they also secured two plates in mid. And their bot lane didn't really lose that much as a result of it. Look, Cheetah now gonna catch that wave down in bot. And Red are gonna extend their gold leads to what, two and a half K now? Like, not only are they making good proactive early game moves, they're actually playing the map very well. Too. And again, I want to give a big shout out to Kelsey. She did a lot of prep and she shared a lot of her uh, notes and like questions that she reached out to the coaches with. Um, she reached out to the red coach and one of the things he was saying was that we feel we're a lot more well-rounded compared to our world's performance. We felt like that we needed to learn a lot and they wanted to make it back to the international stage and they wanted to be more diverse as a team in terms of what they could do. And I think we're seeing that. We're seeing that evolution, that adaptation, that growth of a team. And yeah, I was skeptical of their draft. I was worried about what they'd be able to do, but they are proving me wrong. They're playing the early game well. Now they just need to keep this momentum up and they need to keep the pressure on PSG before they can reach that big two item spike and then look to try and force those team fights. Yeah, because it is important to remember while Red are very much in the lead, their gold is kind of spread out between the respective damage spots on their team, whereas PSG really have all of their gold in the back pocket of Unified. He was the gold leader in this game when we checked in moments ago. And while yes, he doesn't have all the backline peel maybe that an Aphelios would love to have, three out of Aphelios is still something that has to be respected. Has the Gale Force, has the cleanse for a little bit of extra safety. And if it is a game that comes down to full on five and five team fights, it's really just about whether or not he can survive the Gwen and Wukong, and if he does, they're just gonna win every single fight. So it's something that has to be looked out for. For now, Red very much in control. That can all slip away from them. If they fall behind, they lose one or two fights, they lose a couple major objectives. It's PSG still ahead in the Dragon Race, and it's gonna be an Infernal Soul. I'm really enjoying this game. I feel like we've seen a lot of one-sided games today, but yeah, this still feels like, this feels like one of the closer ones. Of course, Red find themselves with the lead for the time being, but you know that PSG, with the comp that they have, can very quickly swing the game in their favor. Traditionally, two teams that are known for their late game team fighting. Mm -hmm. And you feel like that we're building up to that point. Great game to round out day one of MSI with. Absolutely. And now as Red look to break mid lane, their lives become so much easier when it comes to getting Cryo, setting up vision, oh, yeah. looking for these picks. That very we well about. played. Like, the way they use the Herald, they'll secure the mid tower, they'll have that control have the Gwen push in bots, gives you access into the river. The thing they have to be cautious of is all of these deep teleports that are sitting behind them in the bot side jungle. They haven't cleared this area of the map out yet, and the TP is available for Hanabi, so that risk of a flank from the Nar is very real. It is now going in, looking to get the fight picked oh. off. Unified on the backside, untouched for now, but there's just too much damage. You can Gale Force out to safety, but it doesn't look like it's gonna be enough. Unified just picked up, there's no peel for the AD carry. Red walking away with an easy fight. Kaiwing running for the hills. Maybe he cannot hook out to safety, but that curtain call, spelling the doom of PSG in that exchange. Aegis just wipes Bay off the map. Like that Wukong engage followed up by the Leona was Flawless. Very well done by oh, Red. They find themselves 7 and 0. Another kill, making it 8. Red are absolutely dominating this early game. And this 
is a moment that starts to reset the script for this group. If you go to expectations, this group is one, RNG, two, PSG. Not a lot of questions therein. It's a pride battle on the bottom side versus Red in the Istanbul Wildcats. But with Red showing up like this, with a new composition, something we didn't really see them play as much domestically, you start to wonder, can they be the team? Can they be the ones oh, to make the upset? Engage. And a good follow-up as well. Immediately from Cheetan, the root comes through. And like, yeah, we haven't seen a lot of Wukong today, and I don't have a lot of experience casting Wukong, but his damage is pretty nutty when he's able to get into the thick of things. Like, I've seen Armut's Wukong top sure. before, yeah. but Jungle Wukong, the way in which he just comes out of the brush like that, is able to find that initial one-shot. Very well played. The follow-up from Leona was just so lethal as well. Cheetan's just on point with those snipes today. Man, the man hits his shots. Oh, there it is. Absolute confidence. Love to see it in the face of the players. 5K gold Ooh. lead, big, big Wukong damage. And the thing about Wukong is that like, when he snowballs, when he's ahead of the clock, he is such an incredibly oppressive game. Oh, yeah. Because domestically, if you're not an LEC fan, we've seen two kinds of Wukong games. All of them are from Arma. Yeah, yeah. He gets camped, he falls behind, eventually he becomes relevant. Or he gets snowballed and he takes over a game completely. And for Aegis, he's taken over the game completely. This is absolutely unplayable for Hanabi. The curtain call's not even necessary. Get that man an assist. I've, so what? What I'm starting to realize is that knock-up into Root is basically guaranteed CC. Yes. And because the range <laughs> is so long, yeah. it, it, there's nothing you can do about it. You just... And, and like, the reason why I made that comment earlier about like Wukong, normally when we saw Armut play, it was always flanked. Sure. He was always looking for flanks with the Wukong. He was never the primary engage tool. Aegis is always the one starting off these fights, and then the rest of the team follow up behind him. They, he has so much trust in his team that Jojo is going to be right there behind him, that the snipe is going to come through from Chitan, that I'm just really impressed with this coordination and execution that we're seeing from Red right now. It's a fantastic performance from Red. Again, on paper, I did not expect a lot from this team, oh, but yeah. they are truly showing up today. The way they're doing it, incredible. This is a team composition that if they had fallen drastically far behind in the early game, would have been so, so difficult to execute. But with this lead, they are playing it to perfection. Use the range of the Jin and Zoe for setup or for follow-up. Let the Wukong, the Gwen, and Leona run in face first, do the damage, find the picks, and it's working out fantastically for them, and CB Law has to be feeling good, because most tournaments do not start like this for the CB Law. Admittedly. Yeah. Brazil have been known to get those early leads, and they're not quite able to close it out. That is true. We need to see Red now not get over aggressive, control the map well. And we've been impressed with their lane assignments so far and how they've been managing their waves, but can they actually secure that win? Can they get themselves ahead on day one of MSI? Right now, things are looking good. They're playing through two lanes. The analyst has talked about this, how rather than trying to play the entire map, just focus on the two lanes. And they have control, a wave pushing in top. Oh, this is good. I like this a lot from Red. They're, they're following the steps here. They're using the wave they have in top. They don't want to overcommit. They just want to clear out the jungle, maintain control. Look for and Aegis uh, going into the backside, but Hanabi has Meganar. It's not too far off. She's done. Gonna go out with the blast code. Have to be careful here. Cannot get over aggressive into the Meganar. No matter how big your lead is, Gigu pushing into the mid lane. Bot lane needs to be answered eventually. PSG weathering the storm for now. Yes, and that was a slightly harder engage to follow up on. Good jump from Hanabi as well to disengage from the follow up that we saw. It's again that Wukong engage into the W from the Jin into the then follow up from the Leona. Very devastating, very powerful pick setup. Uh, that this time around, PSG was able to avoid, and as you rightly said, buy a little bit more time. The Dragon now spawning in about 55 seconds. Resets very wisely coming in from Red. Aegis likely going to clear this camp. I wouldn't be surprised to see him base pick up a few more control wards. But he may be running out of time. It's just a difficult spot, too. Unified going for the Collector second. It's going to feel good in some instances, especially against Cheetan and Grevthar, but... Aegis gets so much, has so much armor already between Death Dance and Plating Steelcats. Gets so much more armor from his passive. You just have to wonder if Lord Dominix could have come out here, could have been a little bit more effective, because it really is just about can you survive the Wukong? He will leap into your backline, and if he is not answered, he will kill your backline. And that is going to be the puzzle that PSG have to solve. They're going to send Grevthar to catch the top wave. They have bot pushed in. He does have the teleport available. And once again, Ray. 
they are the aggressors. They will catch the mid wave, push that one in. They lose a tiny bit of vision. Look at that ward just above Wigu. Very deep, gives them a lot of information. And this is going to be uncontested. PSG going to use this window to move towards the Baron. See if they can reclaim some vision control. Gonna be once again, very clean execution. That's why I love that international event, oh. Daniel Dracos, because you always have expectations, right? But they don't mean they anything. Don't mean, because they it's, don't it's, mean it's, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, playoffs happen, right? You know, and then fans think, well, I say fans think, that's not entirely true. Everyone often thinks that, like, you look at playoffs and you think, that's the team I'm going to get at MSI. But multiple patches happen, a lot of time happens, scrims happen, and, like, teams evolve, change, and the expectations have to shift a lot. That's why very few people are very hard and willing to commit to an idea right yeah. at the start of a, a tournament because often those expectations are often ruined. And Red is a perfect example of a team who, I mean, the, they sowed the shot. <laughs> they showed the stats. Yeah. Um, the stats are bad, which is weird because normally every minor region, they're like super top they heavy. They just dominate. They have like plus 30 CS in every lane and they're just better. They just beat everybody better. So the fact that Red have bad early game stats, notably bad early game stats, and are absolutely smashing PSG at this very moment, at least for now, is in a controlled way as well. Very controlled, very slow, very steady, not taking too many risks. It's a huge flip on the script that we're so used to seeing in the early stages of the tournament. And one of the big things for Brazil is trying to reclaim some of that international glory that they've had in yeah. the past, right? They want to be able to be proud of the teams and their international performance and be a region that can be a threat when it comes to international. You can create upsets and challenge the top dogs. And right now, Red is looking good. Of course, still a very long group stage left to go. But to start your tournament like this, Definitely a great showing for Red. Absolutely. Two and a half item Gwen, too, only getting harder for Hanabi to deal with. You can see an early Randuin's coming out there. Just, it looks like, I think, for the slow. Just tried to get away. Maybe some of the base damage is going to come in from Gwen, even if it is armor. They just... Again, look off at this. The side. Now they're playing through all three lanes because they know they have so much control. Very little vision invested towards the bot side of the map, but... Wigu knows that if they come, I can just disengage. I have the Ghost. I have my immune. I'm chilling. You guys just keep the pressure up top side. And the Bisc are just waiting for an opportunity to do Baron. Now, Baron is the problem area. Yeah. Because while they do have Leona, it's not the fastest with Zoe and Jin, but they're looking for the fight. Won't be a problem if they can win a fight. Indeed, could be interrupted, but Ooh. there's just into the backside. He's gonna look for the second proc. Immediately goes invisible, goes for the second proc. It's massive damage. That's gonna be one sleepy jungler. That's gonna be one dead jungler is red. Managed to find the pick. They can turn their face back towards the Baron. The pings are coming out there ready. They have found their window of opportunity. Could they have rushed it with a Jin? Absolutely not. Can they rush it when a jungler is dead and an Oriana is low? Hell yes. That is 10 kills to zero. No blood has been spilt on the side of the Red Canids, and they will convert that pick into a Baron. A incredibly impressive performance from the Red Canids to start off their MSI. And now with the Baron, they have everything they need to break into the base and look to secure their first win. Betty, I'm, this is really, I, I, we're probably saying it too much now, but it's <laughs> really crazy to see this. Upsets happen, yes, but usually they're upsets. They're messy, they're sloppy, but this team clean through every stage of the game. And when they have this big look release, this they get to play engage. fights just like this. It's so good. Shoujo this time with the engage and Aegis with the follow-up and then the the long-range damage. Yeah, I, I was skeptical of the comp because I felt like that it wanted to do too many different things. But seeing in action, I grossly underestimated it. And it may just be because PSG had a very slow game, but all in all, what Red is doing is they're engaging with either the Wukong or the Leona. And Grevthar and Chitan are untouched every single fight. There is absolutely no backline threats that they are worried about and they can always follow up reliably. The worst case scenario for Red is if that Wukong dies immediately, and he just hasn't. They have not been able to kill him because it is always Red that finds that initial pick first, and they create the numbers advantage. So huge credit to Red. The way they're playing this comp is a joy to watch, uh, and it only opens us up even more for future compositions at MSI. Absolutely. Ready to see the rise of Jin as it has been a pretty popular pick so far of the day, both Homie Phoenix and Chitan picking it up for themselves. Igu. Bit of a stun here, Aegis. 
Dividing the jungler, catching him out, looking to knock Eponymy behind him. He's gonna get the double band up to safety. Meanwhile, Unified, oh no! His life is just so hard. Oh, oh no! Cheetah those with the flash and W combo is able to secure a kill. They're looking for more. One more kill. They are not stopping, they are not throwing, they are not giving up, they are not making the mistakes of the past. They are not forgetting the sins of their fathers or forefathers. It does not matter. Today, Brazil is here to dominate. The CB Law is here to dominate. Red are here to dominate. PG, or PSG, rather, are getting ripped to pieces. Another kill will go in the favor of the Red Cannons. 13 to zero. Oh my word. And I thought the most one-sided game of the day might be a G2 game, might be an RNG game, might be a T1 game, but a 13-0. Today, Red are the guys <laughs> wampa stomping their way across this rift. Gigu walking forward, another root onto the 80 carry. Unified's life is a living hell. He's getting picked apart again, and finally the victory will come through. Cheetan, full confidence, a well-earned victory from the entire Red lineup. You always know you're going to get a passionate team from Brazil. And look how much this single win means to them. The group stage is still going to be a long and difficult road. Teams are going to evolve, they're going to improve, and they're going to find ways to shut down what it is that you're good at. But for now, the Red Canids find themselves tied for first with RNG in this group. And it makes the group so incredibly exciting. PSG, can they rise up? Can they find their form again? Same story with Istanbul Wildcats. Are we finally going to see a group where everybody is fighting for a way out of the well, group? Well, this is the thing. The Wildcats, of course, their first game was against RNG, but that was an expected outcome, right? And I think even what we saw from the Wildcats early was a good idea that they just couldn't quite execute upon. Mm -hmm. I feel like we haven't really seen the Wildcats, and it really does set up for an interesting group after this performance. This group is going to be an interesting one to track for sure. I love it, Betty. Sometimes you forget, you get used to the status quo, you get used to the, the, the expected favorites winning out, as has often been the case in stage one in plans. Even if there are a few upset games here and there, gives me hope for a, a thrilling group, a close, contentious fight to make your way out and into the Rumble stage. PSG, maybe back to the drawing board a little bit. Feels like uh, once they fell behind, there weren't a lot of ways back in, and certainly not when Red were playing at the level they did today. I mean, I really do feel like the PSG didn't show us like any form of proactivity, right? We didn't yeah. really see them make a play. They just gave Red a lot of space. And I, I kind of want to see a little more confidence from this roster. We know that they have it in them. And as you rightly said, they need to go back to the drawing board and reevaluate how they want to approach these games. Because if they want to stand a chance in this group, they need to get a little bit more involved in the other game. Absolutely do. Well, before we get into World's Cooldown, we have a question from the latest episode of Riff Reaction Podcast. What are your way too early MSI MVP predictions? Cheat on. Head over to the episode <laughs> on Spotify to share your thoughts. We'll be back after this. is watching get on board check the lanes pay attention to the best join the ranks be the challenger all in for the trophy this is for all senses this is for all players buckle up take notes msi 2022 driven by mercedes eq
Welcome to MSI Cooldown after an impressive victory by CB Law's Red Cannons over last year's semifinalist PSG Town. I'm Draco subbing in for Quick Shot. You probably recognize these guys. They've been here all day. But guys, are you not excited about that? I'm a little sleepy. I got really excited during the game. Also, pronounce again. You got sleepy. You had the late cold time. What? Goldberg, you're you're you're. <laughs> You have not been through enough years of nocturnal to complain about call times yet. Fair like, enough. Jack has that right. You're not there yet, my good friend. No, I'm thrilled, to be completely honest with you. But I'm still, I'm like, in, I, I, I'm in shock. Because every year, the CB Law analysts and coaches and teams are like, our team is great this year. And I'm like, I don't know. And this year, they were right. They look so good. And now I'm like, suddenly on a hype train, I didn't well, even know I could be on. It's, it's so weird, too, right? Because... You look at PCS or LMS in, in the past, and even though they don't have good showings at Worlds, they have been very good at MSI. I mean, PSD's group stage with River and Maple last year in the mid jungle was what, like seven and three? That, that's actually the Rumble stage against the top team. So, like, for them to walk out here and get like zero kills against Brazil is just shocking. 20% of the fan vote was for, for Red Cannons, and they, they just smashed. I, I really generally feel like as well that this was a different red cannons than from what we actually seen in in, in the regional scene when they were playing. Okay. And I was doing a lot of my bots on them here. I felt like they were way slower about it. I felt like the you know actual rotations around the map, making plays. Like we saw three people group mm -hmm. up around mid lane with moving Titan up as well, trying to get kills. I thought that was very uh, different to what we usually saw, where they were more about a slower, steady approach, taking towers, moving them up towards the top side instead. Like they still had creative uh, rotations, but not in the manner as we saw against PSG here today, like they were way more dominant than were they were against their own region. Yeah, we still saw a lot of the same things that you highlighted earlier today, playing mostly on two lanes, Aegis mm -hmm. still being like a huge force for engages, but obviously, Cheetah taking a back step, playing a more supportive role in the form of a Jin, getting these Zoe mid picks. Uh, frankly, not something that I was ready for. I got so used to seeing them just funneling tower plates into a Jinx that I thought that that was the only thing we were ever gonna see from this team. <laughs> I, I love the reaction. I like the Jin pick too, and we're gonna see a lot of meta adaptations as this tournament goes on. Yeah. We haven't seen any Jinx, even yeah. though Jinx was the dominant champion of Spring. So it looks like those nerfs are definitely sticking. And then Wukong, we saw a ton of today. This was kind of the first successful Wukong, which is just like the the ability of those those champions to enable the team comp for them. Like 
Wukong having such large engage range and Jin being able to create the fatal amount of damage from, from long range was a really nice synergy. And then also, since Wukong is enough damage, you feel better about doing uh, a double AP solo lane. So it like no one's going to want to stack MR against Jin, Wukong. Like Overall, the comp was actually really nice for what they wanted to do as well. Completely agree. And I'm interested to see if we see more Jin outside of just the pairing with Wukong, what the jungle meta looks like, what the AD carry meta looks like. But for now, after their first victory at MSI in 2022, Yinsu is now joined by Red Cannon's Grevthar in the Verizon post-game interview. Thank you very much, Dracos. I've got Grevthar here with me. Hi, Grevthar. Welcome back to the show. Congratulations on that flawless performance. Why do you think that you guys were able to win that so dominantly? Um, we were ready and we were training um, really good teams, um, not that PSG is not, but we, find, we thought that they were a bit shaky, I don't know, they were a bit nervous, and uh, we don't, this is not the, their performance from their championship, normal championships, so we don't get it, but we're happy <laughs> yeah, that they were not that good. You definitely capitalized on that. Uh, now, I wanted to ask you about that Wukong pick because quite a few teams are choosing him right now, but you're actually the first team today that managed to get a victory on it. Uh, so talk me through why you decided to pick this uh, champion and why the priority is behind it, considering so many teams are considering him right now. Um, our head coach, Coelho, he thought that Wukong was a good pick in this series. Uh, the only problem with Wukong is that the AP jungler, AP junglers and Graves probably, but we knew that their mid, their jungler didn't play that many of junglers AP, and we removed Graves Graves on the one two three band, so it was really okay to Ages to play because he uh, Johan picked uh, Viego, so it was okay to Wukong. And we had we had the stronger lanes, so it was easier to Wukong to play. So if Wukong don't get like uh, invade or get bullied, he comes strong in team fights, and that worked uh, really well. It's a super good strategy you guys have there. And now tomorrow you're going to be facing Istanbul Wildcats. Of course, there's a lot of history, rivalry when it comes to CV Low versus TCL. Uh, how are you <laughs> feeling about the matchup? And also, what are your views on this rivalry? And for me, it's uh, every opponent is a strong opponent and doesn't matter if uh, what other people say. So we're going to face them uh, with the with the same strategies that we had today. Of course, we're going to adapt something for their team. But uh, I don't know, we won't disrespect them, even though they played against RNG. Uh, RNG is a strong, uh, a strong team. So even though they lost to them, we and they are a stronger team. So, I mean, we will treat, treat them with the respect that you should treat every single opponent, and we will try to beat them. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me, and I can't wait to see you guys play against them tomorrow. Thank you very much. That's it from me and Grefthar here. I'm going to toss this back to the analyst desk. Over to you, Dracos. Thank you very much, Yinsu and Grevthar. I, I like it. Uh, yeah. I also like that he clarified that he feels like, from what they had seen and what they experienced, PSG maybe not playing at the level yeah. that they had domestically. And I doubly like the fact that he called out Wukong maybe weak to some of that product to play. And we really just didn't see a lot of that product to play from PSG today. Yeah, very honest answer. And I'm, I actually wish, I don't, I don't wish more teams would say this. I wish fans understood this a little bit more. Um, yeah. Because like MSI is this tournament where you have one team that goes to the tournament and then that just becomes the de facto strength of the entire region. Mm -hmm. But teams can have bad days. Mm. Players can have bad days. For the interestingness of this group, I'm very happy they had a bad day because it, we started by saying it was this super top heavy RNG PSG and then who's fighting for 30 even though they're never going to be able to advance. Now it's become very interesting to see if this continues to be their level or if it actually was just a bad day. Yeah, I still don't think this group is as top heavy as we started day uh, with and we said that as well in pre-show as well. I feel like RNG is definitely the one topping it. PSG though, they didn't even play that style where I expected them to match down towards the bottom lane. Like I thought today's matchup would be unified versus Jutan and then that would just be the bot lane as dueling out but there was never really a competition in between them and it was never really about the bot lane because uh, red candidates are just so good at uh, moving 
moving their pieces around the map instead, moving it away from the win condition that PSG would usually have. So I generally feel like PSG, we didn't see them at their strongest core level today. We didn't see them play for Unified in the way where he usually takes mm. over the games instead. But part of that was also due to the fact that Red Cannons really never give them the leeway for it. Certainly, and I think one of the big struggles of, of a tournament like this when the schedule is as tight as it is, is just the arms race of adaptation in yeah. a meta like this. And now, PSG went from maybe the expected favorites today if they had won, being able to say, hey, our strategy worked, we know what we're doing coming into the days to follow, to probably having to rewrite a lot of the things that they expected because they were picked apart so cleanly by a team that was probably honestly expected to be fighting for third alongside the Istanbul Wildcats, as you guys have highlighted earlier in the day. and. I love the upset. I like what you said there, Jet. I'm so excited because this makes this group so much more interesting, so much more tight, so much more competitive, but it does remain to be seen. Is this an off day? Is this a one-off game yeah. for PSG? Or are Red Cannons just the better team across the board? The mental battle is going to be particularly hard for PSG because they play RNG tomorrow. So there's a really high chance they'll start 0-2. It's by no means over. There's six games. But when you start 0-2, uh, the feelings of hopelessness can definitely start seeping in. Absolutely. Looking across the schedule, though, Goldberg, there's a lot of things to talk about in this group, but EU as an, EU, as an EU pundit, I got to <laughs> ask you, EU, only region at 2-0 and zero at this moment? Uh, how I you mean, feeling? they are... Well, so I know it's a scheduling thing, won. Jet. Let me let me have they this. They won more you know? games than Faker. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, jokes aside, uh, I still think that what we see as saw as well, and especially from RNG today, they look the most dominant from the top seed teams. I think T1 sure. still a little shaky in the laning phase uh, that we saw against uh, Psycon Buffaloes as well. But I mean, G2 as we too. take a look at for sure. I think it still just shows the normal strength that we're used to seeing from them. You see Yankers, Takamos, and Caps linking up. They have a clever draft uh, with uh, a counter against the short range that comes out. Here in the Anivia as well, with brilliant walls as well, and they don't even have a frontliner in this composition. It's all about playing around with grounding, which can be really punishing if the team you're playing against are really good at team fighting. They have front to back, they just have an immediate engage. That was not the case this time around, though, and because of that, they were able to just do what G2 does best: outmaneuver their opponent, stack on the objectives, and just close out the games. Yeah, it was a very disappointing early showing from EG. They're going to get three more shots uh, mm -hmm. at G2, and then also they need to play order four times. So. so so tons of games to play. Uh, we were looking up the release date of Anivia. <laughs> Anivia was released when JoJo was five. <laughs> it has no relevancy to the game. I was working with jokes because like the top Reddit comment was like, oh, look at Caps releasing the champion with JoJo doesn't know about because he's too young. Yeah. I'm like, well, when was he actually released? 2009. He, was he can born actually say, you know what? I grew up with this champion. I'm just so good with it. Yeah, but... I there's an element of like no one plays Anivia. Anivia statistically has been strong for a long time, and there's yeah. a few analysts that have been talking on Twitter how like that and maybe Velkaz and Cassiopeia have certain windows and drafts, especially oh, yeah. against like a short range maze like Rise. So I actually do think it was a good pick, even if it was super surprising. Um, and also really old champion. Really old champion. Yeah. Also, if you haven't played a lane matchup a lot and you certainly have Dude. not played against Anivia a lot, that champion's weird. She does a lot of damage. She's hard to deal with. The stun range is weird. So this also means we only have five more years before someone could play a champion who's older than them in pro. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> The grin that you have is filling me with life <laughs> on that comment. That is, I'm going to feel like such an ancient, I already feel like an ancient old man. Like, Because oh. you have to be 17 to play pro. So like, obviously, like a 10-year-old has, like if you play Anivia now and you're under, you were yeah. born before 2009, you're playing a champion that's older than you. Just a weird feeling. Like how many games can do that? It's on the one hand, I know I should be proud. We're, you know, we're a prolific Esport, we've been around for a yeah. long time. It's a fantastic game. It's kept you know an incredible player base over here. Don't worry, here. guys. I'm sitting on the side over here. Yeah, still feel young enough. That's, young that's enough. fine. You're you know not old yet. You'll get there one, one day. day. But no, for yeah. me and, and Jet here, I just I just feel like ah, I'm middle aged. That's the sign. <laughs> <laughs> and Nivia got prayed and plowed and it came out when JoJo yeah. was fine. And it won. It's good. It's good. I mean, we've got old a, things can be good. <laughs> exactly. Copium. Diverse. Yeah. Meta. You heard it from Froxen on Dive for or if you didn't, you can check that out. But of course, let's take a look at tomorrow's schedule. G2 and EG, round two already. We talked about rapid adaptation. It has to be even more rapid in Group C. Jet, how are you feeling about round two? Sorry, Goldberg, you're getting cut out of this one. You go, you go next. It's yeah. okay. I'll, I can just go home afterwards. I, I, I had a gut feeling that EG wasn't going to start well. Uh, mm. They, they definitely are, are a team, like, they had such a hot, if, if you look at their NA year, they had such a hot lock-in performance, uh, and then actually slumped in the regular season, got humbled and came back. They were riding some crazy emotional high after 6-0-ing finals weekend. They need to come back down to earth. I think they're going to lose again. 
and they'll still get out of group and then they'll be better in Rumble stage. Yeah, and uh, I'm looking at a schedule right now. I'm trying not to care about the G2 and EG right now. And I actually want to look at a different matchup as well, which is Saigon Buffaloes versus Detonation Focus Me. For me, yeah. tomorrow, that's going to be a very interesting matchup. PCS, or not PCS, VCS and LGL for a long time has had a rivalry in between each other. Even when I was going through prep documents, talking to the VCS casters, talking to the LGL casters, they're like, LGL is saying, we're winning screens against them. VCS is saying, yeah, we're winning screens against them. And they both just feel like they have like the opposite uh, or they have the uh, bigger stick than the other person really just coming in as the favorites to the tournament. And it just feels like I really want to have this one settle it. They both come in with a fast paced game mm. style and I really want to see how they actually falter against each other. Also as a caster, this is my only instance of pure caster bias. I just love casting the VCS because someone's dying. Yeah. I don't know if it's them. I don't know if it's the enemy team. They fight so much. Like, we used to talk about the LPL as a region that was maybe over-aggressive. Obviously, over the years, it's right. been, we've come to understand it better. It's also been toned down. It's much cleaner than you. VCS is uncapped, unmatched aggression. Level 1 Alistair, Flash Q, Tristana, Hail of Blades, Cleansing the Exhaust to get a kill. And it's just... Yeah. It's fantastic League of Legends. See to hero, watch. kill hero. Like it, it, this style has been around kind of as long as League as well. Yeah. But uh, whatever works. Absolutely. Love seeing the different styles. That's going to be all from us here at day one of MSI 2022. We'll be back tomorrow with the second day of group stage, hoping for more great underdog stories, more crazy upsets, more crazy picks. We'll see you all then.